I want to definitely echo what has been said of welcoming those both who are incoming and new as welcoming back students who are returning and particularly welcoming back faculty and staff who I know are eager to teach and to pour their lives into you, even as I hope, and I've been praying for you all, that you are eager to learn. I would say it is a great honor and privilege, and I count it as such to be counted amongst you all, to those who would serve alongside of you, to serve our Savior who died and who rose again, conquering death for us. It is a privilege to serve the hero of all history, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, and to be prepared here and now in this year to lead not just an organization, but to lead the institution that God has ordained for this era, the church, the bride of Christ. There is no more noble endeavor. And so I hope that is impressed upon your heart and your mentality as you conduct yourself this year. And truly, I echo that it is a great honor to serve not above you all, actually to serve beneath you all and alongside of you all. May we always set our life in ministry to the Lord Jesus Christ. And along that line, this message and in a sense, a charge this morning, I hope and I intend is to instill a perspective. It is to instill a kind of pace for the entire year of how you approach your studies and not only how you approach your studies and how you learn, but hopefully it helps to ingrain in your heart how we lead our people as we go through the authoritative word of God and that revolves around the notion that the scripture is the absolute truth. We need to renew our minds in that. And that is particularly because right now, everything we are in and everything that surrounds us, everything in our world as we know it is truly theory. We live in a world of theory. You have evolutionary theory. You have theories on viruses and how governments handle it. You have psychological theory. You have critical theory. You have critical race theory. You have theories on communication. You have theories on business models. You have philosophical theories. You have a theory for everything. In fact, they even have something called the theory of everything. That's how far theories go. It reminds me of a time when I was teaching at the Master's University and I was having lunch with a business professor and I said, what did you get your doctorate in? And he said, well, I wrote a theory for my dissertation on how the stock market works, how you can anticipate when the stock market goes up and goes down. And when he said that, all these professors and students immediately came around and said, that's why you're rich. We knew it. Tell us the secrets of the stock market. How did, what did you discover and how did it work? And so he started to explain his theory. We're taking diligent notes. And then one person astutely asked, does your theory work? And he said, no. (laughs) That was the conclusion. It doesn't work. And then I said, wait, you got a doctorate. They passed your dissertation for a theory that doesn't work work? How does that work? And he said, well, you have to keep in mind that the six professors before me who also wrote on the same subject, none of their theories worked either. So they had to pass me and that's how it works. And if you're wondering, wait, does that mean that I can write a paper on something that's wrong and then pass? Can that actually happen? My answer is this, theoretically. And that illustrates the issue. That illustrates the issue of how we understand this world, of how things are viewed in this planet and in our existence. Everything in our mind is theoretical. We live in a time when you are in a time of theory, where everything is optional. Things are not certain. Things may not necessarily be real or true. Things are hypothetical. Things are in the realm of possibility. Things are abstract. Things are intangible. Things are not concrete. Things can be qualified. Things are subject to our discretion. Things have exceptions. Things can be tested. Things can be changed. Things can be adapted. And things can 
can be wrong and that's okay to us. We view this world and we label everything over and over habitually as theory. And as a result of thinking and viewing and categorizing things as theory, we dilute what the truth is. We dilute what the truth is. We keep saying we believe this book is absolute truth and the propositions therein are absolute reality. But do we really, do we really believe that in our hearts as we approach it and as we teach from it? Do we really know what that means? You say, yes, I believe that scripture is absolute truth, but then we say things like, well, the scripture is subject to our verification. We need to make sure that what we concluded is actually real and comports with our reality. Well, if you're the standard of verification of the scripture, then you're the one who has the last say, not the scripture. You're the one who's absolute, not the scripture. And then we say things like, well, I believe that this is the absolute truth, but, but well, there's qualifications on it. Like we need to have sometimes missing categories that we need to put in the scripture. If you have to insert new categories into the scripture for it to cohere and for it to make sense and for it to be true, then it's not the truth. It's deficient. It's missing something. It's defective. And then sometimes we think, and we hear it around the world around us, well, I believe that the Bible is, of course, the absolute truth, but it doesn't actually pertain to situations nowadays. There might be exceptions to the rule. Or certain things that it had were antiquated. If that's the case, And the scripture is not absolute truth. It is not universal. It is not universally, constantly, and consistently real. When we say we believe in absolute truth, the nature of something that is absolute is that which is fixed, is that which is determined, is that which is defining, not qualified, not restricted, not confined. If something is absolute, everything bends to that and it bends to nothing. But if you keep insisting, we keep insisting that we have to verify and qualify and restrict and negotiate with the scriptures, then you really don't believe this is absolute. Let me put it simply. You don't negotiate with absolute truth. You just obey it. That's it. You don't negotiate with absolute truth. You just obey it. That's it. But in our mentality, what we have done in a world of theory is we have diluted the authority and the sufficiency of this book. In a world of theory, we have taken what absolute truth is and what it inherently demands, and we've lessened it. And sometimes we don't even realize that reality, even as students In our studies, sometimes when we view the scriptures, we just say, well, there's just a bunch of views on how this is supposed to happen, and I just got to know them for an exam, and I just get to pick and choose the one that makes sense to me, the one that I like. Then you're not treating the Bible as absolute truth. You get to pick and choose. You get to select. It's just an academic exercise for you. It's something abstract. It's something theoretical. It's just something out there. It's not absolute truth. And it's not just seminary students or university students who do this. Our people do it. Not with malicious intent, but the influence of the world can be pervasive. They elevate their own thinking above the scripture. Well, I don't know if that's really, that really makes sense to me. I don't know if I buy that, what the scriptures say. And in doing those kinds of things, they demote its authority. They demote the scripture's authority. We claim sola scriptura, rightly so. But sometimes our actions are not sola scriptura, they're scripture second, and we're the first. That's really what's going on. Who rules who? That's the question. And in light of this, we need to renew our minds and we need to recover what truly is in the word of God. All that the word of God is in its absolute truthfulness, what that really means. And we don't just need to understand that theoretically. We need to understand that convictionally. 
as it really is and as it really always must be. And so in light of that, turn with me to Proverbs 8. Let's renew our minds together as we go through Proverbs 8, verse 22 and following to understand the nature of the absolute truthfulness of Scripture. And by way of context, as you're turning there, it is appropriate to briefly discuss the context of Proverbs 8 because you need to understand the alignment of intent to talk about these very issues of absolute truth. I think and I know and I suspect that we all here, like many of our people in our congregations, they love the book of Proverbs. Everyone loves Proverbs because it's so insightful, because it's so practical, because it's so precise, because it's so instructive. And in a lot of ways that appeals to us, amen and amen for such wisdom literature. But if you really stop and think about it, if you really take a break and contemplate it and take a step back and analyze it, the book of Proverbs is a book that is very difficult to accept. It is a book that is very difficult to accept. Solomon talking to his son, my son, my son, over and over again in the opening parts of Proverbs gives some very difficult counsel to a young man. He counsels him on the nature of his friendships. He counsels him on what he should trust. He counsels him on laziness and on pride and on sexual morality. None of these issues are easy for a young person to submit to. We know that. We understand that. Yes, Proverbs is practical, but it's a hard book. And if you go through the book of Proverbs broadly, there are statements in the book of Proverbs that would never be acceptable to our world and our culture today. Think about Proverbs 23, verse 13. Discipline your son, beat him with the rod. He will not die. Go ahead and tweet that. You won't get very far. Likewise, do this one. Proverbs 11, 22, as a ring of gold in a swine, so is a woman without discretion. That's the intersection of multiple problems according to our world. That is the conglomeration of multiple issues that the world would contend against Christianity. Yes, you think that the Proverbs are practical, insightful, and helpful, and they are, but let's not forget for a second that Proverbs, like the rest of Scripture, with its powerful truth, runs against the grain of this world. This is not just counsel for the sake of counsel or wisdom and insight and practical notions that anyone in the world would accept. That's not true. That's not true. And for a young man who is struggling with these issues of sin and needing to hear some hard things, the question will be like it was then as it is now, Why should we listen to these hard things? Yeah, they're practical. Yeah, they're incisive. Yes, they're insightful. But why should we listen? These are difficult things to accept. These are difficult things to swallow. These are difficult things to abide by. When everything in sinful flesh and everything in sinful culture goes the opposite way, why do you listen to what Proverbs has to say? And tucked in the middle of the entire discussion is Proverbs 8, where we are this morning. And what Solomon reminds his son, and by extension what he reminds us all, is the simple truth. The reason you listen to this is because it's the absolute truth. The reason you listen to this is because this is the way it is and you can't fight against it. The reason you listen to this is that this is what is always true without exception. This is the way things are. You can't fight it. And if you do, you will be hurt. This is the definition of the way things are. You have no choice. You have no choice in the matter. This is not up for debate. This is not up for discussion. This is just up for submission. That's what Solomon reminds his son. And we also, as we approach the scripture, especially as we are being trained and prepared to lead the people of God, this is the exact mentality we need to have every time we touch and open our Bibles. And so I'd like to give you, really, Solomon would like to give us three characteristics 
of absolute truth. Three characteristics of absolute truth. And the first one, the first one is this, that the Scripture is authoritative. The Scripture is authoritative, and we can see that in verse 22. In verse 22 and verse 23. Verses 22 and 23 remind us of the authority of Scripture. And it begins with this phrase, Yahweh possessed me at the beginning of his way. And let's talk about that for a moment because, yes, we recognize at this juncture, especially in a seminary context, that there are some Christological issues here. There are issues that are needing to be clarified because some have wrongly used this to argue that, yes, Proverbs 8.22 talks about Christ. Christ directly, everything applies to him, and therefore he must be created. Cults often appeal to this, especially in the way that Proverbs 8 is incorporated into Colossians 1. And so there is confusion, Christological confusion here, and we need to clarify that. But in clarifying that, my point is actually the Scripture's point here, which is that it makes a point about the nature of Scripture, and that is what we must focus on, even as we have to clarify these issues. And so what does it mean? that Yahweh possessed me, personified wisdom. What does that mean? And I would say it means two things. Two things. First, and fundamentally, it means union. It discusses union. When you think about possession, when you think about ownership, you are actually connecting and something else is a part of you. When you have ownership of something, it's quote unquote, your stuff, it is a part of what you own. It is part and parcel of the categories that are within your hand. It's within your collection. It's within your estate. You own it. It's connected with you. It, in that sense, has union with you. In fact, sometimes, especially in elementary school, but it goes to this very day, seminarians do this all the time, you even put your name on it, especially your books. You put your name on it to show people, this is mine. It's a part of me. Part of Yahweh possessing is actually demonstrating union. It is demonstrating connection. And this immediately puts a corrective on the entire discussion of Christology and such. We can talk about the specific ways that Proverbs 8 is incorporated into Colossians, and that is fair, and that is important. Nevertheless, on a more fundamental level, people have misread Proverbs 8 because Proverbs 8 is not trying to argue that wisdom is less than God or derivative of God or some kind of derogatory nature of God, but rather it is actually arguing that wisdom is unified with God. It is of God himself. It is not something lesser. It is something a part of him. It was first, just like he is first in that regard. There is a union therein. We have it backwards sometimes in our Western mentality. But with this, and this is important, the point that Solomon is making is that when you think of wisdom and when you think of revelation, it is of God. It is of Yahweh. Yahweh possessed me. This is not about human opinion. This is not about human options. This is about God. And our God doesn't just know best. Our God knows all. That's what makes this book all sufficient. He knows what he's doing. He knows above anyone else what he's saying and all that is necessary for life and godliness, all that should be revealed. This is complete. You can't improve upon it. Who do you think you are? Do you think you know more than God? What we need to remember is there is no book like this book. There is no book like this book. This is the only one that is divine and divinely inspired. This is the only one that carries by union divine authority and divine revelation. This is it. And we need to handle it that way. If you approach your Bible with the same attitude as you approach any other thing in life, you've forgotten what this book is. We've drifted into a world of theory instead of absolute truth. Yahweh possessed me, 
reminds us of the union of wisdom with Yahweh, union of revelation with Yahweh. But it also reminds us of this other idea. I, like I said, the notion carries two ideas, and the first one, like I said, is union. Here's a second, utilization, utilization. After all, when you possess something, when you own something, you use it. And some of you here, and maybe your wives would confirm, you say, well, some of the things I own and some of the things I possess, they're just collecting dust. Well, that's what you're using it for. You're using it to collect dust. It has a purpose. No matter how you look at it, anything you have, it has a purpose. Even if its purpose is to do nothing, it has a purpose. You've assigned it that by being there. And in the same way, when Yahweh possesses wisdom, at the first of his way, before anything of old of his works, as the text says, it reminds us that he is utilizing wisdom. He is using wisdom. He is implementing wisdom as an instrument to craft and to carve everything that there is in creation to shape all the mechanisms and operations and entities of this cosmos and world. And with that, that means because wisdom is engraving and shaping and everything, it is also likewise embedded. It is hardwired into the way this world works, which means this, wisdom is definitional. Wisdom and the revelation of God, the nature of that truth, it is the fabric of this reality. And that's worth thinking about for a second. You see, we, we often don't realize the power of definitions, but definitions hit at what is bedrock. Definitions hit at what is so fundamental and foundational. You can't get underneath it. All you can do is stop there. And as opposed to trying to bypass or explain it further, all it does is it defines. It sets what is, and you have to respond to it. If you struggle with this kind of logic, let me just give you an illustration. Let's pretend you're talking to a little kid. These kinds of conversations are very frequent and normal. And what do little children often ask? One word. What is it? Why? I love the question why. It reminds me when my son first asked the question why. I was so thrilled I started lecturing for two hours. <laughs> he, he, he didn't ask why for several years. It was, it was pretty good. But kids love asking why, and I love answering it. And you can have a discussion. A kid says, I want to jump off the bed with a towel around my neck and fly like Superman. And you say, okay, you can't do that. You're going to get in trouble. Why? Well, because if you jump, you're going to fall. Why? Well, because you don't have enough air resistance in the towel to parachute you down, and that's not going to work. Why? Well, because there's this thing called gravity that will pull you down. It's about two different objects of mass interacting with each other. There's a whole theory about it, but it does exist in this world by inductive testing. Why? Well, that's because God made the world that way with those laws in place. He designed it. Why? Well, that's because it's for his glory. Why? Well, because it's for his glory. Why? Because, because it's for his glory. Why? You can't go any further. You've hit definition right there. You've hit definition. You can't go further. And for you, you get frustrated because you can't get deeper. You can't get further. That's the cause. That's the determiner. That's it. And for the kid, he's delighted because he stumped you. <laughs> and so we understand what a definition is. You can't go beyond it. You can't get underneath it. You can't get around it. All it does is it sets the baseline and your only response is to abide. What does wisdom say? I'm the definition. I'm the way this world is. I'm the one who crafted everything in this planet. I'm the one who shaped the first of his way. I'm the one who is from the foundation, from the earliest works of old. I'm that one. Often we treat the Bible like a suggestion, not a definition. Sometimes our people will say, well, that doesn't make sense to me. I don't, I don't buy that. There is nothing not to buy or not to make sense. It's a definition. It's the way it is. 
You, don't, you can't respond that way any more than someone responding to gravity or any more than someone responding to the foundational reality that that's the way God made it and that's it. That's what we have to understand. This is not an opinion. This is not a suggestion. This is not an option. This is not a theory. This is the definition. Everything it proposes in it and asserts within it, it's the definition. It's the way it is. And you can't get around it. It's the bedrock. And all you can do to it is submit to that. Sometimes, in our studies, we treat the Bible as just a textbook. It's not a textbook. It's your definitions. And that's how we need to respond every time we read, we open, we listen, we understand the truths of this book. It's the definition. You just bow the knee. That's all we do. And it's not just divine because it's united with God. It's not just definitional because of how God used it. It really is definitive. Look at verse 23. Wisdom proclaims personified. From everlasting I was installed. From the earliest times, before the beginnings and the earliest moments of the earth. Verse 23. The idea of installed is to be installed as a king, to be installed as a ruler. And we understand intuitively the nature of authority structures, the nature of ruling structure. Children learn it quickly. They start telling their parents and screaming at them, why didn't you give me the toy? Why didn't you buy that cereal? Why didn't you give me the candy? And then one whack later, they understand you don't talk to your parents like that. They understand very quickly. You understand this. You say, how so? Well, for some of you who have been here for more than one year, or more than one semester. At the end of a semester, what happens? Inevitably to professors. Oh, Dr. So-and-so. Oh, Professor So-and-so. You gave me this grade. Oh, could, could I had troubles. I had trials. I endured Job. I was Hebrews 11. Could you help me and raise my grade? It was a C minus. Could it be an A plus? <laughs> we know that. Notice, no student comes up to a professor and says, sir, that grade, unfair. I protest it. What are you going to do now? And the professor, if you came with that kind of attitude, what would they say? You're right. The grade is unfair. Thank you very much. It should have been an F minus minus if ever such thing existed. That's what they would say. We know authority. We know authority. If someone is above you, you do not challenge. You do not come insolent because there are consequences if you do. And we understand this even with the physical world. Going back to the illustration of the child who wants to jump off a bed or whatnot with a towel wrapped around their neck and you have warned them, even though they've been belligerent and asking you the why question, that that's not wise. And they try to do it anyways. Now, in your sinful heart, you kind of rejoice because child will meet gravity and there will be only one winner of that situation. You can't fight reality and win. This is reality. You can't fight it and win. Why do you think that sin makes you dumb? Why do you think that sin makes you foolish? Why do you think that when you sin, you get hurt? Because you cannot fight the truth and win. You're fighting against reality. You cannot take fire into the bosom and not be burned. You cannot run into a wall and not get hurt. You cannot jump off of a bed in this world, at least, in this earth and this planet and not fall prey to gravity. And in the same way, this is absolute truth. This is the definition. This is the way things are. And if you oppose it, you're just going to get 
hurt. There will be consequences. Why? Because this is the truth and this is the way things are. And if you are not according to the way things are, you are out of alignment with reality and you will be crushed as a result. Wisdom has been installed from eternity past over everything that there is. There is nothing to trumpet and there are no exceptions to that rule. That's what we need to understand. And even as we study the scripture, here's what you need to remember. There are always consequences when the word of God is presented to us. If we disobey, there will be consequences. Do not treat in your studies, your study of God and theology and the word of God as if it was inconsequential. Every time you approach, this isn't just some subject you can pick up and leave off with. This is a matter of hard and serious consequence. You cannot fight the truth. You must always, always submit to it. The word of God, divine wisdom and revelation, it is authoritative. It is divine, it is defining, and it is definitive. And we need to surrender to that. We need to surrender to that. Well, in addition to all of this, the word of God is not just authoritative. Second of all, it's abiding. It's abiding. And we see this in verses 24 through 26. And really, the opening of verse 24, where it says, Before there were depths, I was brought forth. Even the language of brought forth there reminds us and emphasizes wisdom's connection with God, because it doesn't even say the word give birth and and when a child comes out from his mother. Rather, it is talking about the labor pains of when a child is within his mother. And so the language of union and unity is there. And it is stressed in this way, in this context, before the depths, I was being conceived, I was being wrestled with in that way. And with that, with the word depths, it goes all the way back to Genesis chapter one, where the spirit is hovering over the deep. We know that language in Genesis one, two. And what is the author of Proverbs reminding us? The revelation of God, the truth of God, the the reality of God and the realities that he revealed, they are before God ever created. They are timeless They are before everything. They are therefore universal. They are therefore constant. Here's what we need to understand about the word of God. It doesn't change. It abides. It endures. It has no exceptions. It has no modifications. It therefore is all sufficient. And there are several ways that the author of of the book of Proverbs explains this to us in vivid detail. Notice the rest of verse 24. It talks about before, The springs were heavy with water. Now in Israel, and I pray that sometime you have opportunity to go to Israel if you haven't been there already, you can see amazing springs. You can see springs in places like Jericho or Jerusalem or En Gedi. There are springs there that constantly and consistently produce very clean and crisp and and even cold water. It's amazing. And it's astonishing to think this. It's astounding that these springs produce water even in times of the highest and hardest drought conditions. They might not produce as much water, but they still give off water. And they've been doing that ever since they've been there. David talks about these springs. Abraham encountered these springs. David and Jesus encountered these springs. Of course, the apostles who traveled with Jesus, our Lord, encounter these things, and you can encounter the same thing. The springs are ever constant, always producing water. That's the nature of the word of God. In fact, God says, the constancy of a spring, what gave it, it's constant. It's the divine revelation. It's the word of God. It's wisdom. It's his wisdom in action. Sometimes we wonder, and sometimes our people wonder, well, maybe I'm the exception of the rule. Maybe the Bible's operating and the truths therein are operating, but it just doesn't operate at this time, or it doesn't just operate in this circumstance, or it doesn't operate in my life this way. No, the Bible's like a spring. It's always operating. It's always been there. It's always been producing. Before you were born, it was like that. Before your grandparents were born, all the way through the time of Abraham, all the way through the time of Christ, all the way through the time of David, all the way through the time of times, it has always been producing. 
That's the constancy of God's word. There are no exceptions to it. Likewise, it's not just that it has that constancy. It has a stability. Verse 25, before the mountains were established. Mountains are strong. They don't just disappear overnight. And when they're rooted, they don't move. Sometimes we think we can embellish and add to God's word. It's missing something. There's nothing missing in a mountain. It's firm. It's solid in the same way the word of God is. You don't need to add to it. And certainly you don't need to subtract from it. Look at verse, the rest of verse 25. Before the hills were, I was brought forth. The interesting thing is that the, with the word hills, the most common adjective is everlasting the everlasting hills. Why are they called that? Because in Israel, the way you traveled and the way borders were established were by the hills, by the ridges. And there's a simple reason for that because not everyone in Israel wants to be a track star and run down the valleys and then up the hills. That's just really, really foolish. So instead, they, they just travel along the ridges travel along the least path of resistance. And in fact, what's fascinating is even Israel's modern day highway structure still revolves around those hills. Hasn't changed, hasn't changed, still abides. Boundaries, geographical territories, roadways, all defined by the hills. Sometimes people wonder, well, yeah, I know the Bible said these things, but maybe that's irrelevant now. Maybe that's not pertinent now. Maybe we've grown out of it. Maybe we've evolved and progressed from it. Not true. The hills still define Israel to this day. They're everlasting in that way. What gives them that kind of perpetual, constant definition? The revelation of God. The revelation of God. The word of God is always constant. There are no exceptions. There are nothing that you can add to it. You cannot subtract from it either and think that you've evolved out of it. It's always constant. It never changes. And you say, well, I understand that. That's a fundamental truth. How do I live that? Look at verse 26. When the world had not yet been created and its environs, and notice the last phrase as well as the head of the dust of the world. Let me ask you a simple question. We've been talking a lot about how God made the world and he gave the world its constancy. He's the constant behind the world's constancy. And in light of that, who's made out of dust? Man. Here's Solomon's point. Wisdom is so constant. Wisdom is so universal. Wisdom is so enduring. It's not just over the mountains. It's not just over the hills. It's not just transcending over the ever-producing streams and uh, springs. It's over you. It's squarely over you. You are not an exception to this. And more to the point, don't forget this. You and I, we're just dust. Have you ever been to a national park and seen a great mountain in Yosemite or whatnot? And have you ever seen a person take a piece of dust and flick it at a mountain and say, everyone run, it's over. No way, that person is over. You know, they're gonna arrest that guy. Because it's absurd to think that a piece of dust could rival a mountain, could rival a spring, or could rival the everlasting hills. What do you think you really contribute to that which made those things so strong? You and I, we're just a speck of dust. What do you think you really can add to the Bible? What do you really think you know better than the scriptures? We need to remind ourselves of who we are as we come to this. We're not better. We're not a peer to scripture. We're dust. And the scripture rules over the first of the dust. Scripture abides. We do not. And so we've talked about the authority of scripture, and we've talked about the abiding nature of scripture. Let's talk about the actuality of scripture. That's the third and final point. And we see that in verses 27 through 31, really. 
verses 27 through 31, the actuality of Scripture. Often in a world of theory, here's our problem. Everything's hypothetical. Everything is what if. Everything is abstract. And we just relate things to ideas out there that have no pertinence, authority, relevance, impact on our world. It's all theoretical. And that's often how we treat the Bible. But what the author of Proverbs reminds us here is that's not the nature of Scripture. The nature of Scripture is when the heavens were established, I was there. When the earth was made round and I established a a circle upon the face of the deep, I was there. That's how real the Bible is. It's right here, right now. It's ruling. It's ordaining. It is establishing. It's as real, let's put it this way, as the sky has been made strong from above. Verse 28 You've always heard the phrase, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, and we laugh because we know that's not true. Why is that true? Because the word of God made it so, because God declared it so. That's how real his power is. It's the power that gives stability. People often want stability. People want often normalcy. What gives people stability? The word of God, because it originally gave so, and it does so even now. How about this? What strengthens the the springs of the deep. We know that springs produce water and you need water to live. You wanna know how real the Bible is? It's more real and more powerful than water. It's more real and more effective and more necessary than food or drink. You need this more because it doesn't just make you a difference right now. It makes a difference for forever. It's that real. Let's also think about it this way. It is in verse 29, when God established a boundary for the sea and the waters and he told it not to pass a certain point. That is how real the Bible is. It's about the operations of this world. It is as real as that. Often in our modernistic thinking, we think, oh yeah, science, that tells me what's real. It observes how things work. It observes how things are. It observes how things operate. Science, that's the real deal. In our modernism, that's often our opinion. Here's what you need to know. The Bible is more real than science. The Bible is more real than science because it not only tells you what is, it tells you why it is. It tells you the whole story. It is more real than that. That's what the author of Proverbs reminds us of here. And even the end of verse 30, it talks about, or at verse 29, rather, the foundations of the earth when those things were established. We often take for granted how stable, how firm the ground is under our feet. What gives the earth its firmness? The very words of God, the same authority of God found in his wisdom revealed here in scripture. You want something stable? You want something firm? You want something this real in this world which carries this kind of consequence? It's the word of God. It's not just some theological thing out there. It's not just some theoretical thing out there. It's not just in the world of ideas, but not tied to our reality. This is embedded as the world is round, the sky is above, the earth is firm, and the sea moves in a certain way. It's that real. And that's what we have to understand, even as we study the word of God. This is not just some theoretical subject you can play around and experiment with. This is about your life and your people's lives. It's that real. And just to illustrate it, even in verse 30 and 31, it reminds us of how real it is. Because when you abide by the worker of wisdom, that's what it talks about in verse 30, I was by his side as a master craftsman. I was the delight daily. I was the one rejoicing before him. When you abide by reality, then you have joy just as wisdom had joy. That's why in verse 31, as he talks, as wisdom speaks of rejoicing in the world of his earth and being the delight and having its delight in the sons of men. If you want joy, if you want happiness, and there is often nothing that people understand as more real and as more relevant and as more pertinent than happiness, and joy, and delight. That's something people know. That's of this world. That's real. That's not theoretical. I want that. That's immediate. What do you need? The word of God. The word of God. My prayer for you all is that this year would be filled 
with joy, would be filled with delight as you understand the wonderful things of God's word. But there's only one way that will happen, is if you actually treat the Bible as authoritative. If you treat the Bible as abiding and you don't know better than it, you're just a piece of dust. And if you treat the Bible as actual, not just a subject to be studied, and then you can put the book back on the shelf and jettison from it your mind and compartmentalize it away. But this is as real as the sky and the sea and the earth that you live in. This should be shaping your life every single moment of the day because it's that real. And then when you treat it as absolute truth, you'll have absolute joy. And my prayer for you is that you do that with your whole life and your whole heart as you approach your studies this year. Shall we pray? Our God and Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that this is not just a theoretical subject that has no bearing on this world. Thank you that this is a subject that is stable. It provides truths that abide. They don't change, and we can't improve on them. Thank you that this is from you. It is divine and divinely authoritative. It's the definition and how we need to cling to it. May we learn wonderful things from your word. Be equipped to lead your people all the more through life under the sun. And may it all be because we understand this book is not theory in a world of theories. This book is the absolute truth. And we bow to it, and we don't improve on it. We submit to it, and we live. That's what must be done. And may that produce in us the greatest joy, for then we are living the way you always made things to be. And then we fit rightly into how you have ordained and intended all things. And when that fit is attained, we have joy. May that be in our lives, and may we learn these lessons well as we go through our study this year. And may that carry us through the entire not just year, but the entire course of ministry and service you have for us to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.